Hello. Before we start, I'd like to thank some new patrons. So, Holly Sinclair and Dante, thank you so much for your support, and I hope you'll continue to support us into the future. What? I'm your host, Tom Kearns, and welcome to the Anglo-Saxon England podcast. Episode 27, The People of Gawissa. Our first secure historical date for the people who became the West Saxons occurred at some point in the mid-630s, when a missionary called Birinus baptised their king, Kinegils, at his royal palace near Dorchester on Thames. According to traditions, which circulated among later generations of West Saxons, they already had a century's worth of history prior to this date. But this history, as it's come down to us, is often vague and contradictory. In this episode, I will attempt to unpack that history for you. Unlike Mercia, We have many written sources, or at least comparatively many written sources, for West Saxon history. A constant refrain in the Mercian episodes was how frustrating it was to not have a Mercian perspective on various major events. Well, in the case of Wessex, we don't have that problem. But with the relative wealth of evidence comes a host of other problems that need to be unpacked before we can start looking at the early history of the West Saxons. Northumbria has Bede, at least up until the year 731. Wessex has the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which covers the entirety of Anglo-Saxon history from the Roman invasion of Britain until well after the Norman Conquest. Great, except the Chronicle has a lot of problems in its own right, especially when it comes to the earlier parts of Anglo-Saxon history in general, and the earlier parts of West Saxon history in particular. Many of the problems of its account of West Saxon history come from when the Chronicle was created. The original version of the Chronicle was created in Wessex in the 890s, during the reign of King Alfred. Alfred, a man who was passionate about reforming West Saxon education, consciously or unconsciously exerted a major homogenising influence on the account of early West Saxon history, which results in the Chronicle, like the traditions of all other Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, presenting a history centred on a legendary founder and his heirs, who constitute the ruling dynasty of the kingdom, and this just so happens to be the same dynasty of which the current king is a member. The message is that the current king's dynasty is unassailably legitimate, having guided the kingdom from literally its earliest days. We saw this with Erla in Northumbria, Ichel in Mercia, and now we see it with Serditch in Wessex. Such traditions are still useful, since they tell us of the traditions that were circulating within these kingdoms about their own origins. But they are not historical, and no matter how many dates texts like Bede or the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle ascribe to them, their ahistoricity remains pretty clear to us now. There is a second problem with using the Chronicle too uncritically. The Alfredian original no longer exists. What we have are various copies, called recensions, which were made of the original and expanded with extra material from other sources. All these copies were made by hand, and this makes scribal errors unavoidable. Thus, we can have different dates, or different names, or even wholly different entries based on a scribe misunderstanding or miscopying their sources. And in most cases, these recensions were not based on the Alfredian original itself, but rather on other recensions, causing such errors to be transmitted and expanded over time. We have to remember that the scribes were like us, and if they saw something they couldn't quite read, then they would go with their best guess based on context. Or if they read something that seemed to contradict something else, or that just didn't really make any sense, they would try to fit it into the overall scheme in a way that seemed plausible and reduced logical problems. That's very understandable, but it's easy to see how it could lead to mistakes that became compacted over time, and thus make using the Chronicle's recensions in isolation from other material unwise. 
most modern editions will print the different recensions side by side for just this very reason. But for our purposes, it makes using the written evidence to reconstruct the early history of Wessex, or indeed any Anglo-Saxon kingdom, extremely complicated. As a rule, we should treat everything in the early years with suspicion, unless it can be corroborated with external evidence. In what follows, I will attempt to cut through the uncertainty of early West Saxon history, using both the written evidence and the archaeological evidence. Going back to these earliest origins takes us back to a point when the West Saxons weren't yet called the West Saxons. They were originally a tribal group by the name of Gawissa. In his ecclesiastical history, Bede makes it clear that by 731, the names Gawissa and West Saxon were interchangeable. West Saxon only began to be used by the kings of the Gawissa during the reign of Cadwalla, which lasted for about three years, from 685 to 688. This reflected a more multi-ethnic, we might say more imperial attitude, that defined the West Saxon kings from Cadwalla's reign on, and which was the result both of military successes, but also of military setbacks. But I'll get more into that in the next episode. For now, I want to focus on the history of the Gawissa, and the earliest stages of West Saxon history, up to that mid-630s date I mentioned at the beginning, which is when West Saxon history definitively moves from the mists of legend and uncertainty into some kind of identifiable historical reality. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle records the activities of a legendary first king of the Gawissa, named Serditch, who lived between 495 and 534, and conquered the Britons living on either side of the Solent, that is, the strait between the Isle of Wight and mainland England. The accounts of Serditch found in the different recensions of the Chronicle are not consistent. They frequently give different dates for events and sometimes outright contradict each other. They all agree that Serditch was the ancestor of the West Saxon kings, and the surviving regnal lists confirm that his was a legend of an ancestral figure that was well established in court circles by the 9th century. But his story, as given in the Chronicle, presents issues beyond different recensions offering different details. Perhaps the greatest, besides the inconsistencies, is the fact that there is no compelling evidence to believe that the earliest settlements of the Gawissa were located on the Isle of Wight or in southern Hampshire. Those regions were settled by Jutes, not Saxons. The claim by Bede that these areas were independent of Wessex until the reign of Cadwalla testifies to this, and the archaeological record confirms it. Since these regions were culturally distinct from the Saxon culture of Wessex, until around the time that they were eventually absorbed into the New Kingdom. Despite what later legend claimed, the earliest Saxon settlements which became the core of Gawissa territory were probably located in the Upper Thames Valley, around Abingdon and Dorchester, in modern-day southern Oxfordshire. How do we know this? There isn't much written evidence attesting to it, but archaeological testimony indicates that in the 6th and 7th centuries, there was a concentration of Saxon settlement around Dorchester-on-Thames in southern Oxfordshire. This close association is also supported by the mission of Birinus mentioned at the beginning of this episode. Following Kenegill's baptism in the mid-630s, a bishopric was established at Dorchester-on-Thames. If we think of other royal conversions we've discussed, it wasn't uncommon for the first bishopric of a kingdom to be established at or close to the realm's major royal centre and thus the creation of a bishopric at Dorchester-on-Thames suggests that this was Kinegil's main royal centre. Thus, Serditch, if he was a real figure at all, probably led early Saxon raiders and settlers into the interior of England along the River Thames, much as early Mercians migrated inland along the Trent and the Avon. The settlements in the Upper Thames were not the only Saxon settlements in southwest England at this time, Princely burials of the 6th century around the city of Salisbury in Wiltshire are evidence that Germanic peoples had settled in the region quite early, but the crucial question is, were these people Gawissa? It's impossible to know, since they left no written evidence. B tells us that these areas were part of Wessex by the 680s, but that doesn't mean that they were originally West Saxon. 
As with Mercia, it is probable that there were many small tribal groups in the region before the rise of a single overlord, but that these groups, having been absorbed into this new overlord polity, are now completely lost to us. These westerly settlements are also the subject of an alternative theory of Gawissa origins that I want to briefly present to you. Two prominent features in the landscape of southern Wiltshire are the ancient hill forts of Old Sarum and Barbary. The presence of early Saxon settlement in the area and these hill forts have led some scholars to propose that this was the heartland of the Gawissa, chiefly due to the uncertainty of what the name Gawissa actually means. In Old English, the verb Gawissa means reliable, and its corresponding noun means something like certainty. While we may be able to imagine that a group would like to be known as reliable or trustworthy, this etymology has long had its opponents. These scholars suggest that the name may derive from a Britonic word, gwaith, which means fortification or hillfort. These scholars point to the similarity of the name Gawissa and that of the Hwitcher, a group located just to their north in Gloucestershire. Both names, they suggest, are anglicisations of the Britonic word, reflecting both groups' origins as mixed Anglo-Saxon British communities of their kind that were common in the west of England. See the episode on the origins of Mercia for more on that. In this reading, the Gawissa may have originated around Old Sarum, a region with many prominent hill forts, and then incorporated either by violence or slow absorption, the Saxons settling around Dorchester on Thames. I think that this is an interesting theory, chiefly because it engages with the question of exactly what the name Gawissa means. But personally, I agree with the current majority view that the Gawissa were originally based in the Upper Thames and expanded to include these other early Saxon settlements in the West at some point in the mists of their early history. The Old Sarum theory also has the benefit of highlighting the extent to which the Gawissa, like all other Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, reflect a mixing of British and Germanic groups. Not only might the word Gawissa be an adaptation of a Britonic word, but many of the earliest West Saxon kings have names that are clearly of Britonic origin. Serditch's name is thought to be a version of the British name Keratic. His grandson or great-grandson, Keulin, has a name with no obvious meaning in Old English, and the later king, Cadwalla's name, is clearly an anglicised version of the Welsh name Cadwathlon. Although the West Saxons quickly became thoroughly English, their origins were certainly a mixture of Saxon and British, just as we saw in the case of Mercia and Northumbria. So to summarise, the legends of Serditch's conquests are probably just that, legends. In reality, the Gawissa most likely originated in Britano-Saxon settlements in the Upper Thames Valley around what is now Abingdon and Dorchester-on-Thames. There were other Saxon settlements in the area westwards that would eventually become part of the Gawissa's territory, but we have no way of knowing if these groups were originally independent of the Gawissa or not. So, this is the big picture of early West Saxon history. With the flaws of our evidence in mind, is it possible to get a more detailed account of how the Gawissa developed and expanded prior to the rise of Cadwalla and their transformation into the kingdom of the West Saxons? All Anglo-Saxon kingdoms have a certain historical event horizon, before which all figures may well be legendary. In the case of Wessex, as I said at the beginning of this episode, the first king we can be reasonably confident actually existed is Cynegils, who ruled from 611 to 642, because his reign has left enough of a footprint outside of later written evidence to be independently verifiable. Prior to Cynegils, we are on much shakier ground historically. That's not to say that none of the kings prior to him existed, but we ultimately only have the testimony of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, and so we must be wary when discussing them. I've already talked about how the account of Serditch's foundation of Wessex in the Isle of Wight is probably not correct. There is also a great deal of uncertainty regarding Serditch's son, 
In all the entries in the Chronicle which refer to Serditch, he is recorded alongside his son Kinrich. This Kinrich, we are told, succeeded his father as King of the West Saxons in 534. In the Chronicle, Kinrich is allocated a rule of about 26 years, which, although not impossible, seems quite unlikely, given his career as a prolific raider. In another source, the genealogy of the West Saxon kings, which was compiled during the reign of Alfred but separately from the Chronicle, Kinrich is presented as Serditch's grandson, his father being Creoda. If you think back to the episode in the Origins of Mercia, this Creoda son of Serditch is the West Saxon who may have inspired 13th century historians to create the fictional Creoda grandfather of Penda. No legends seem to have survived about Creoda. He was only a name in a genealogy, but he is relevant here because his exclusion from the earliest recensions of the Chronicle may account for the unusually lengthy reign of Kinrich. And this seems to establish a pattern in the early history of the Gawissa, in which periods of uncertainty or chaos were glossed over by artificially extending a king's reign to present the image of an unbroken line of succession from Serditch to Alfred. Kinrich, like Serditch, spent most of his time harassing the Britons. The interesting thing about his reign, though, is that his sphere of operation shifts sharply to the north of the Solent, into territory that we know was part of the Gawissa's domain prior to the rise of Cadwalla. Specifically, we are told in 552 that he defeated the Britons at a battle near Salisbury, and the chronicle, we presume, means here to tell us that this is how Salisbury became a part of the Kingdom of the West Saxons. Kinrich died around 560, and was succeeded by his son Caolin. This Caolin, in many ways, is the first really important king of the Goessa. This is because he is listed as the second Bretwalder by Bede. If you think back to the episode on kings and kingship in Anglo-Saxon England, you'll remember that the Bretwalder is a term created by the authors of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle referring to a category of ruler that Bede lists in his ecclesiastical history as having overlordship of every kingdom south of the River Humber. We only have Bede's word to go on that Caolin was a Bretwalder. The Chronicle doesn't really give any indication that his activities drew much of southern England into his domain, except for possibly Kent. In 568, the Chronicle says that he defeated Athelbert of Kent, but other than this, the main focus of his activity is his wars against the British in the southwest. Between 571 and 577, he is said to have captured settlements including Aylesbury, Insham, Gloucester, Cirencester, and Bath, all of which were major centres of the West Saxons from that point on. But despite these successes, it's not entirely clear if Caolin actually existed. He clearly follows in a tradition of early Gawisan expansionist kings, who secured the rule of the entirety of what would become Wessex itself. As such, it's difficult to tell what is historical and what is just 9th century authors projecting the scope of Wessex in their day back into the distant past. Caolin also suffers from the problem of inconsistent reign lengths. Depending on the version of the West Saxon regnal lists we use, he either reigned for 7 or 17 years. Given what was said about Creoda and the artificial inflation of Kinrich's reign, it seems that Caolin may be another example of later writers attempting to present an uncomplicated version of Gawisson history, either as a result of trying to make sense of complicated sources or out of a desire to strengthen the ancestral authority of King Alfred. This tendency only becomes more problematic once we enter the period after Caolin. He was deposed in 592 by his cousin Caol. We don't know anything about Caol except that he was later succeeded by his son Chaelwulf in 597, and that Chaelwulf was himself succeeded by Kinegils in 611. It was this Kinegils who gives us our first definite date in West Saxon history, when in the mid-630s he was baptised by the missionary Birinus under the patronage of King Oswald of Northumbria. With Kinegils, the Gawissa move into firmer historical ground, but that doesn't make the job of the historian all that much easier. 
since between Kinnegills and Cadwalla lies one of the most contested phases of early West Saxon history. This episode has already dealt with a lot of complicated issues, so I'm going to save that period for the next time, when we can dive into it with refreshed eyes. So what have we learned in this episode? Well, we've had a crash course in how having good written sources doesn't necessarily make our jobs as historians that much easier. The earliest history of the Gawissa is a case in point. We're confronted with a hodgepodge of different traditions, which later writers attempted to simplify in a manner that certainly suited the rulers of their day. This makes getting to the heart of what really occurred problematic. What we can tentatively say is that the Gawissa originated in the Upper Thames Valley, and at some point before 611, they absorbed various Britano-Saxon groups that existed to their west. The Gawissa were themselves a result of the mixing between Britons and Saxons, and many of their leaders bore anglicised Britonic names as proof. But the traditions about these earliest kings were all probably legendary. Certainly there is not enough independent evidence surviving to definitively say that men like Serditch, Kinrich or Kaolin actually existed, but their legends nevertheless tell us something about the Gawissa's traditions surrounding their own origins, which do seem to have some link to reality, even if this is only tenuous at best. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Anglo-Saxon England podcast. If you have, I'd like to request that you leave a like or a subscribe or a comment or a rating on whatever platform you prefer to use. I also have a very exciting announcement. As you've probably noticed, this show now has ads running on it. This is because we've partnered with the Evergreen Podcast Network, who are very kindly helping me to keep this podcast going. I know that ads can be somewhat annoying, and if you are very firmly against them, we do have the option of listening to episodes ad-free on Patreon for $5 a month. That would also include the bonus episodes that are going up, and so it would give you even more content without ads. But whatever you do, I am extremely grateful to every one of you who listens, and I hope that you will continue to listen and be satisfied with this podcast that I'm creating. So with that, I've been your host, Tom Kearns, Thank you for listening to the Anglo-Saxon England podcast.